I'm Tali Bauer, incoming SIOP president. It's my honor to provide the introduction for the presidential address this year. Fred will talk about Team SIOP and SIOP strategic partnership initiatives. But before he begins, let's take a few moments to learn a little bit more about SIOP's leader. So it's going to be the life of times of Fred Oswald. In 10 minutes or less, the clock is ticking. Here goes. From an early age, Fred was always a little bit cowboy, even when he lived in LA. Here we see Fred in the front with his brother Carl in the back. Fast forwarding quite a few years, he went to the University of Texas Austin where he earned a BA in psychology. Moving east, he went to the University of Minnesota for his master's and his PhD. He always had cool shirts. A lot of photos of cool shirts, I picked one. Then he went to Purdue University as an assistant professor for two years. Go Boilermakers. Michigan State University for nine, where he was a proud Spartan. And then landing at Rice University in 2009 until now. Home of the, are they mighty owls? At least owls. <laughs> so here you see him uh, photographed as a graduation platform marshal. And this really exemplifies Fred, stepping up and being a great citizen. I wanted to make sure I did my research when I got up here to give this talk. So based on my network of informants, there were a lot, SME interviews, personal observations, and social media sleuthing, I've discovered that Fred loves at least six things. Here goes. First would have to be Beth. In 2011, Fred and Beth were married in Texas. I wanted to learn a little bit more, so I asked people, and 100% of respondents indicated strongly agree to the following statements. <laughs> Beth is awesome, Beth is smart, Beth is good with and for Fred. Thank you, Beth. Number two, I didn't see this one coming, but last year at SIOP, someone sent me a photo. It was the first thing I received for this talk. And it was a Fred in New Zealand with a bottle of water. And this would prove to be prophetic. The first quote I got when I asked people tell me about Fred, Fred loves going to Bucky's to get a Coke Zero. Other people said Fred's happy places are LKT and Pocantino with a Coke Zero and anywhere with his legendary margaritas. And the very last thing that I heard about Fred was, Fred loves beer. <laughs> so I think you all know where I'm going here, right? It's really obvious, the evidence is clear. Fred loves liquids. <laughs> Number two, Coke Zero, more photo evidence, margaritas, and there's even Bec Becky, so it's really, it's all true. There's more. Fred starts his morning every day when he's in town going to Starbucks first thing. He's so well known and well liked there. When they opened up a Starbucks two blocks from his house, they let him in before anyone else, before they were open, as customer number one. Doesn't always mean they spell his name right. <laughs> number three, Fred loves pinball. If you know anything about pinball, you know that that's not just any pinball machine. That's Adam's family, it lives in Fred's house, it is the number one best-selling pinball machine of all time. And those who've seen him play fancy him quite the pinball wizard. Number four is cats. If you know Fred and you've been on social media, you know he posts a lot of pictures about cats. Fred likes cats. And what he'll tell you about the cats is a few things. But one is that they're not really his, they're Beth's, and he has nothing to do with it. But the photo evidence would tell you something different. At some point, I had three or four slides of cats, and my husband told me I had to stop. So there's just, just gonna be two. They say you aren't supposed to have favorites, but everyone agrees Violet is his favorite. Now, I was sent a photo of what I was told was Fred's all-time favorite clothing item of all time. Because I'm a good friend, and a good colleague, I am not going to show you that photo. But I am going to let you ponder it a bit, because the item is a cat swimsuit. <laughs> ponder away. <laughs> Number five, Fred loves science. He loves open science. He loves open practice. He loves advocating for science. He loves doing science. He loves editing science. And at last count, Fred was on as many editorial roles as he has cats, and that's five. Number six, if you talk to Fred for a little while, you realize that Fred loves Scrabble. So I collected some Fred Scrabble stories. Number one, he plays in national tournaments and has been nationally ranked. Number two, Fred calls Scrabble shuffle in the tiles. 
When Fred could not find worthy opponents in his immediate circle, he took matters into his own hands. A few examples. Going to area nursing homes and playing with residents. <laughs> Before words with friends was words with friends, friends had, Fred had what multiple informants described as a scrabble machine, which friends felt they occasionally had to hide as an intervention when he played too often. His highest scoring words with friends game is reproduced here, 640 points. Longest word ever, watercolorist, 13 letters. And I wasn't kidding about the tournaments. Here we see a picture that Fred took at the Buffalo Niagara Convention Center. And in 2010, he was ranked 42nd, which is impressive. But his real claim to fame is that he beat Stefan of word freak fame. Now, if you know about Scrabble and the world of Scrabble, this guy is a color commentator for ESPN Scrabble. It's a big deal. He beat him that day. And the only thing better than Scrabble, you might ask, it's cats playing Scrabble. <laughs> mm -hmm, so. There you go. And in spirit of Scrabble, I wanted to share words that research participants mentioned about Fred. I heard lots of words, things like multitasker, positive, helpful, good citizen, engaged, contributor. Emailer came up a lot. Email, he's fast on that email. Fred it. When Fred gets a hold of a document, he can't help but edit. He's altruistic, he's a team player. I also heard phrases like a great guy, a great scholar, impactful, smart, a great leader, and thoughtful. And I couldn't agree with all of those more. An example of what a giver Fred is, is when I asked him if I could raffle off a lunch with him, he just said yes. He didn't ask why, he didn't ask how, just said yes. So, to celebrate Fred and his love of words, we've created a Fred Oswald world word scramble, which will be available on the tables outside. So we've scrambled words from his introduction about Fred. You wanna grab one, fill it out, turn it in. There'll be available boxes in the hospitality uh, desk and membership table in the committee zone. And somebody's gonna win lunch with Fred and some PSYOP swag. It could be you. But Fred also loves PSYOP. I think that's really clear as he lives his life and what he's done over the last years of his career here with PSYOP. PSYOP is fortunate to call Fred our president. It is with great pleasure that I introduce PSYOP President Fred Oswald. Thank you. Great, thank you Talia for that illuminating introduction on the topic of me. Um, I feel uh, lightly grilled uh, instead of roasted. Um, so good morning, PSYOP. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, you traveled to the conference safely and you prepared to have a terrific PSYOP 2018. We'll leave the conference having done nothing less than improving the science and practice of IO psychology, improving each other and improving ourselves. It's crazy, but it's true. And how about those PSYOP awards and fellows recipients that we just heard about? This heavy dose of talent is certainly inspiring, whether you're a graduate student, a practitioner, a young faculty member, or me. PSYOP is so fortunate to have and recognize so much expertise and talent in the room. Let's keep figuring out how to continue to recognize our talent and to maximize it to the benefit of PSYOP. I've kept our Reservoir of Psyop talent and potential talent, i.e. you, firmly in mind when you bestowed on me the great privilege and responsibility of serving Psyop as your president. Because Psyop is about us over time. It's not about me at this very moment. Although standing here, it sure feels like it. <laughs> My term as president has been but a year, and so like most Psyop presidents, I've worked towards strengthening our continuous efforts while initiating new ones. All the time you spend on PSYOP during the off hours that you don't have keeps many activities and committees moving forward and with tremendous energy. Together we try new things, abandon some old things, and change what we have. In other words, we're adaptable. So how does my vision reflect our current state of affairs? How did I choose this theme of Team PSYOP that has pervaded PSYOP over the past year and in your conference program? Well. 
Being trained at the University of Minnesota in IO psychology, I'm a pretty data-driven fellow. So I went back and I surveyed all the themes of past IO presidents that I could find. And you can see a small, friendly sample of those themes here. I took all these SIO presidential themes that I could find, and I did a subjective factor analysis with a Verimax rotation, of course, <laughs> to arrive at two basic factors. Incidentally, this subjective factor analysis was uh, interrupted by a daydream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe SIOP should invest its liquid assets in creating new national landmarks. Uh, forget Mount Rushmore. Uh, you can take your next summer vacation here. OK, so I finished up that daydream, finished up my mental factor analysis, and I arrived at two major factors, identity and impact. The identity and impact of PSYOP, of IO psychology as a field. We love both our identity and our impact because PSYOP and us as IO psychologists, we are so much and we do so much. And yet it is also a healthy sign of strength for PSYOP to continue to question, investigate, and test ourselves. PSYOP presidents over the years have effectively used language associated with identity and impact that inspire ourselves to new levels of challenge and greatness, that strengthen our sense of communion and group pride, and that magnify our important concerns for the safety and integrity of the field. So back to my own theme, Team PSYOP. Why Team PSYOP? Because teams, in the broadest sense of the word, cover both identity and impact. You could say I wanted to hedge my bets and not be brave and just pick one. That's true. To understand Team PSYOP, let's learn by example from this year. Here you can see the PSYOP UN team whose mission is, quote, to bring the theory, research, and practice of work psychology to support the achievement of UN mandates. In keeping with this mission, this PSYOP UN Brown Bag Breakfast series is a new initiative that began under my term. Here you see photographic evidence of the recent April session led by Doug Reynolds on HR management in the digital era. Doug is on the left there. It's very well received. Anton Bota from the UN is pictured on the very right there. And he's noted that the series is gathering a good reputation and the attention of upper level leadership. In fact, the Assistant Secretary General for Human Resources, Martha Elena Lopez, attended Doug's session and made opening remarks that included high praise for this SIAP UN partnership. Given its success, the SIOP UN partnership will continue this brown bag series, and the next speaker, Gary Latham, is scheduled to speak at the UN on the morning of Friday, June 8th. Like Gary, I have nothing but praise for the UN team's difficult and specific goals that they've been defining, pursuing, and achieving. Okay, so that was a concrete example of Team SIOP. Now let's look at what Team SIOP means in a more systematic way. I got to thinking about Team Psyop's identity and impact as being the analog of a measurement problem. I'm something of a measurement person, so no surprise. And when you're developing a psychological measure, you hope for it to be reliable and ultimately predictive of outcomes of interest. To do that, you have to come up with a set of items to test out. At the level of Psyop, this sort of measurement process could be said to have begun 32 years ago at the first Psyop conference. 1986 was thus a formative year for SIOP, perhaps with some formative measurement going on, where SIOP was exploring before we could then build up our strategy and reliability in a more reflective manner. So let's do some time travel back to SIOP 1986. Irv Goldstein was our president back then, and he passed a few years ago. The question back then was a tentative test of SIOP's viability. Back then, we asked ourselves, if Division 14 held a mid-year conference that was separate from the APA conference, would people actually come? Well, they did. 776 people came to the conference with 34 sessions and an $89 hotel rate. <laughs> These three numbers have gone up dramatically over the years, <laughs> and you're probably happy about two of them. <laughs> so we're a third of a century into SIOP conferencing, we're back in Chicago, just a few short blocks from the Marriott Hotel where the first IOP conference was held. And so I know Milt did this, but how about we recognize any members from the initial annual conference steering committee who are listed here and happen to be in attendance. 
Could you stand up? All right, so adding to that, how about we recognize all the people who have attended the very first SIOP conference. If you could stand up. And don't sit down yet. Let's add those people who have been to SIOP for more than 20 years. 20 years or higher, if you could please stand up. All right, now everybody, if you could take a look around, accost these people, buy them the drink of their choice, in exchange for infinite PSYOP wisdom. All right, thank you. Moving on from PSYOP 1986, notice our growth here from that original 776 over 32 years ago. Thanks to Evan Sinar's helpful visualization he provided me, you can see our PSYOP attendance statistics over the past 12 years. The PSYOP conference has radically increased in its numbers and importantly, has increased the range of talent and people representing our field. That diversity will continue to increase to reflect the world that we already live in. Now let's look at our last year. As Daisy Chang had noted, we've shattered our PSYOP conference attendance record, which happened to be just last year in Orlando. You are a data point for this new record-breaking number, so you should pat yourself on the back. Go, go ahead, I'll wait. Yeah, some of you are doing it. All right, all right. So in terms of attendance, Team Sob's reliability keeps getting stronger and stronger. But going beyond the numbers, let's look at our SIOP executive board. They help us to define, plan, and then meet the goals that we seek to accomplish. Many of you, maybe you've never seen our executive board structure before, but this provides the backbone for SIOP's identity. Here are the vertebrae. Each portfolio officer listed here is responsible for a set of committees. For instance, you can see how under the professional practice portfolio there are four committees. And the three you see here with asterisks are new ones that were developed this past year through the hard work of Rob Silzer and Will Shepard. These committees expand on and replace the professional practice committee as the SIOP practice membership itself has expanded to ask for and benefit from these services. SIOP looks forward to seeing these three new committees flourish in the coming years. Likewise, the publications portfolio led by Deborah Rupp has established the new organizational science, translation, and application book series with Steve Kozlowski serving as its inaugural editor. SIOP hopes to see a strong two-way street with this translation series where research innovations can better make their way into practice to provide value to employees and organizations. Also very importantly, practice-based innovations should translate to inform science in ways that change the nature and impact of IO research, not in order to be faddish, but in order to be more relevant to the world. Let's dare to dream big here in these translation efforts with, big, with best wishes to Steve as he kicks off this initiative. For many of us, the SIOP, uh, SIOP and the conference seems to work magically on its own. And indeed, it's gratifying that year after year, SIOP delivers a terrific conference experience. But let me finish this slide by expressing the critical need to attract and grow our SIOP leadership that is always working extremely hard to make SIOP and its conference effective for its members. Simply put, for SIOP to keep improving upon itself, we absolutely need to recruit and select the wide range of talented SIOP members who will join, engage in, and eventually lead our committees and the society. We're experts in recruiting selection and training, so I'm convinced we can do this. Expanding active SIOP membership participation in our infrastructure not only keeps SIOP fresh, healthy, and better attuned to our own needs, it offers a wider range of SIOP members greater opportunities for their own professional and personal development of the sort I've been privileged to benefit from for more than 20 years. How can SIOP strengthen the structural back backbone that I just showed you? Do we need to keep adding more committees, make committees better, have committees communicate better with one another? The answer is all these things as done, as is done in all adaptable organizations. So let's think about this in terms of a measurement reliability problem. When developing new measure, we want what's called controlled heterogeneity. This is a fancy way of saying in measurement that items need to vary by the right amount. Asking the same question five times, that'll get your alpha high up to 0.99, say. Hey, that's great. But it probably ends up being a silly measure. Likewise, 
asking five extremely random questions about things like your favorite cheese, if you like Scrabble, and whether your shoes are tied is obviously silly. I do like Scrabble, by the way. <laughs> um, this yields a measure with approximately uh, zero alpha. So the general goal of item and test development is essentially the same for building SIOP's core identity, to define and cover the landscape that we're interested in and that we're experts in. If we're too narrow in our definition of identity, then we're excluding important expertise and associated people. But if we're too broad, then our message and identity almost becomes random. It becomes diffuse and indistinguishable from our environment. SIOP is constantly working at getting it just right, somewhere in the middle. Controlled heterogeneity. Although I think I may be, be the only one calling it controlled heterogeneity. But tell your friends, and uh, hopefully the term will become viral. Here's another way to illustrate the general issues in measurement as it relates to SIOP's identity. I might be showing you this just to let John Campbell, my advisor at the University of Minnesota back in the mid-90s, know that I still think about these things. The dark circle shows the construct we intend to measure, such as SIOP's identity, and the light circle shows what we're actually measuring. If we're not measuring what we probably should, then SIOP's identity is deficient. If we're measuring things that we shouldn't, then SIOP's identity is contaminated. The goal for SIOP is to keep reflecting on and adjusting our identity to keep our deficiency and contamination to a minimum so that, again, to paraphrase Goldilocks, we have SIOP just right. Regarding construct deficiencies within SIOP, SIOP leadership approved a committee in January of this year called the Women's Inclusion Network, or WIN. WIN will be holding a meeting during this SIOP where they'll discuss the nature and means for improved internal and external support for SIOP women, in addition to covering research about gender in the workplace that is critical. More, furthermore, I appreciate and look forward to participating in a SIOP session regarding how we can continue our work in generating tangible solutions for advancing women within SIOP and within the field of biopsychology. That session, by the way, is in the Sheraton One at 3 p.m. tomorrow in hopes that many of you are interested in attending. As an example of reducing construct contamination within SIOP, SIOP's executive board this past year approved the formation of the Committee for the Advancement of Professional Ethics, or CAPE, chaired by Deidre Nat. The need for this new committee was born out of the general and longstanding concern and reality that as IO psychologists, we all routinely make professional decisions that reflect ethical choices, if only by default. Helping IO psychologists more explicitly recognize and navigate situations requiring such choices can only make us stronger as a profession. I encourage you to learn more about CAPE and many of, I, uh, many of SIOP's other active committees in the committee zone located near the SIOP exhibit hall. I'm also excited to announce that SIOP will be increasing its overall identity or reliability through a website redesign, or really I should call this a massive overhaul. The details are too technical for me to describe or even understand, but essentially we're in the process of upgrading the IT guts of the SIOP website. At the conference, the SIOP administrative office is seeking focus group participants bright and early at 7.15 a.m. tomorrow and Saturday in the Lincoln boardroom. The SIOP leadership in the administrative office, though, is wide open to website possibilities, especially in the early stages of development here. And if you can't make it bright and early like that, uh, please contact them with your thoughts after SIOP, um, and they would definitely appreciate your input. Overall, I'd say the SIOP website needs to be more outward facing, communicating our identity cogently to other stakeholders that we care about, such as the promising high school student expressing IO psychology related interest, or the news reporter who wants to know quickly how IO psychology might inform a current event, or the practitioner who has IO colleagues and wants to learn more about their profession but is afraid to ask or a federal agency who might consider IO psychology as beneficial to its national efforts, if only it could easily learn more about the problems that our field addresses when it quickly goes to our SIOP website. Through SIOP's revamped website and the impressive coordinated efforts of SIOP Media, and through our white papers and government advocacy efforts that you see on this slide, we can continue striving to identify, consolidate, and communicate the challenging real-world problems that we solve. This problem focus reflects our validity, our impact. By the way, I want to single out the Veterans Workforce Transitions Initiative you see at the bottom here. 
It's very active, and in fact, Nate Ainspan, who leads the initiative, wants me to let you know that any interested people are welcome to meet with this group today at 2.30 at the hotel bar to discuss the initiative and its next steps. So there's 7.15 a.m., and then there's 2.30 at the bar here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. But speaking more generally, I want to point out that the people, organizations, and agencies that SIOP wants to connect with tend to focus on these important problems that we can help address, that we do address. And then they appreciate our IO-specific training. At the conference and when we talk to one another, we're part of this terrific club, and we tend to focus on our specific training first. This all makes complete sense. I wouldn't want to change it. But the point I want to make is if we want to speak to the world at large and we actually want to be heard, then we need to keep listening and communicating with a strong problem-based focus. I think the SIOP translational series that I mentioned earlier will help a great deal to this end. We also have uh, the all-day Team SIOP theme track today that has an exciting problem focus, a validity focus. And you can see here uh, many challenging issues are being addressed here talking about translation of our work to other disciplines, and taking on timely and important topics of innovation in organizations, and combating community violence in Chicago. As individual professions, we already gain attention from engaging in issues important to organizations and society. However, we all would benefit in the long term, even more, if SIOP members could remember to advertise our profession, in a sense. I used to think such advertising was too immodest, but now I hope that when it's done in the right place and at the right time, there can be great benefits to the field. There's nothing wrong and something to be gained in the long run when gently but continuously reminding people of things like, she's an IO psychologist whose insights solved this problem. I think we'll see this type of push for promoting IO psychology woven into Talia Bauer's new initiatives as incoming SIOP president. And I look forward to these pushes on the problems that we solve in the real world. SIOP's impact and validity also comes from uh, not only its leadership, but critically from the ground up as well, where SIOP members think globally and act locally, engaging in the important problems of their communities. SIOP.org online contains a wide array of resources regarding local SIOP groups, including a list of those local groups with connections to IO group leaders, a calendar of local IO events that the local IO committee keeps up to date, and finally, please stop by the SIOP conference booth designed to get attendees more information about local groups in their area and connect them. Each year, the committee links about 100 people to local area IO groups and to help support them in the creation of new local IO groups. And I hope those numbers continue to increase. I hope they increase year over year, just like the conference itself. It's certainly exciting to go to the conference every year, but there's another type of reward to engage in a local IO community on a much more frequent basis. SIOP impact and validity also demonstrated itself this year strongly in its robust and reliable research initiative. The initiative was kindled in 2017 by the re reproducible research track that Zach Horn helped to kick off, where SIOP conference submitters can share any and all of their submission materials in the name of transparency, accountability, and open science. Following that, Steven Rogelberg led a task force that produced an impressive and extensive paper by James Grant and their team on what actions SIOP can take in the name of open science. I strongly recommend that you read this important report. It's important to all of us as scientists practitioners, and it's available on uh, the IOP Cambridge uh, website. This report led to Tina Curler and her group taking the reins in improving SIOP reviewer training that you experienced this year, and it's now being extended into training materials for reviewing journal articles. Other report-related initiatives are in the works as well, and in supporting these efforts, what I've been suggesting all along the way as, it, as it's being developed is that the most modest changes probably deal with the most frequent issues, so that when they're implemented across the board, that can lead to a remarkable improvement in the overall quality of the products of IO research and practice. We don't need to push for the most advanced statistical methods until we push for all descriptive statistics being clearly and consistently reported. Let's get things like that done first. So hopefully you see by this point how SIOP works hard, works smart, and works adaptively on its identity, aka reliability, and its impact, aka validity. 
We also work hard on tying the two together, as can be witnessed this past year under the leadership of Alexis Fink, whose Future Scanning Task Force proposed and ended up creating the SIOP Future Scanning Committee with Richard Landers as its chair. This new committee contains liaisons that cut across all our existing SIOP committees, where the express goal is to work together for the purpose of connecting and communicating with disciplines outside of I.O. so they can better appreciate how our identity plugs into new futuristic streams of impact, ranging anywhere from advances in training for safety and work teams to providing expert guidance regarding the appropriate and ethical application of artificial intelligence and machine learning tools. The progress of this committee will make the education and training of our graduate students more important and relevant for our ever-evolving world of work. The committee work will open up a wealth of new research and practice opportunities. And let's not forget, It'll be amazingly fun and exciting for SIOP to be able to deliver the value of IO psychology into new fields and innovative directions. Extremely fundamental to, IO, to, to SIOP's progress on all fronts, reliability, validity, and our SIOP conference every year, let's never forget and always appreciate our SIOP administrative office. Perhaps it's no surprise that the SIOP Administrative Office just won the American Society of Association Executives exclusive 2018 Gold Circle Leadership Award for its extensive revamp of the SIOP Partnership Program, bringing the value of SIOP, the SIOP brand to the organizations that employ and support our members in their important work. Yeah. The AO has deep knowledge of the breadth and history of SIOP, reflecting the substance and the people in IO psychology that have played out over time. If history tends to repeat itself, then we should talk with the AO more frequently to try and learn a lesson or two while we forge our destinies. The AO also represents IO psychology every day. They educate and inform external parties and potentially interested members about IO. When someone Googles IO psychology, gets to the SIOP webpage and has questions, then nine times out of 10, they're talking to this person, Jane Teggy, who's the face of our profession in many ways. And speaking of faces, that led me to this idea. <laughs> I think the AO deserves its own national landmark as a tribute of thanks for all they do for SIOP and its members. They're also Team SIOP. <laughs> So in closing out this talk, and as my tenure as SIOP president will be soon at an end at the end of this conference, I'd like first and foremost to give thanks to my wife, Beth Christofferson. Beth has been my life support system and my love support system. She's had the incredible fortitude to put up with me in all my SIOP antics this year. And she's put up with me for many years prior as well. Thanks to Talia Bauer and Mort McPhail, SIOP's incoming and outgoing presidents, respectively, whose talents and support are amazing. We've worked extremely well together, if I do say so myself, uh, sometimes on a daily basis. And now, with a year gone by, I'm now very proud to consider them my very good friends. I can only hope to give them the same support to, to Talia and our incoming president, Eden King, in the coming year. Thanks to Lee Kronbach for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and last but hardly least, thank you for all that you do for SIOP and in support of one another. You can't say I didn't recognize you during my talk because all your names are here. <laughs> Let's keep working together, increasing our reliability and validity. It's a never ending process and adventure. Again, thank you for letting me serve you and enjoy the conference.